<laughs> Start over. Yeah, so um, I was just going to say thank you for being here live or for watching the recording because um, I really know how valuable your time is and any time that you are willing to invest in becoming a more effective, more equitable and more inclusive teacher, that just motivates my work. So I appreciate the gift of your time today. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, if, if you've been in my previous sessions, this will be very similar. I like to start with a question for thought and then end with a similar question in between times. And during those times, I'll look at the chat and um, interact with you in that way. Generally speaking, though, I keep my eyes on the camera because that is actually an, an immediacy cue, a nonverbal immediacy cue that helps to close the distance between us. So I won't be watching the chat. Feel free to interact with each other in the chat box and collaborate because, again, I know you have good um, suggestions and things that you've been trying. So feel free to do that there. We will pause for some questions and conversation part way through, and then we'll have time at the end for additional questions and conversations. So pretty similar to what we've done before. Today, we are going to focus on equitable and inclusive teaching. And although I do, um, yeah, as Kathy mentioned, it's going to be really for no matter what modality you're teaching in. I have ideas that will support your students, whether they are virtual students with you, whether they are in person, whether there's some combination of the two, whether you teach synchronous or asynchronous. A lot of these concepts and strategies, I think, we're, are going to give you ideas for things that you can do in your classes. So again, as you may know, I always uh, generally start with a little bit of information about myself, another way to close the distance, but I actually skipped that for today <laughs> because I have so much to share with you as usual, maybe a little bit too much, um, but I would encourage you to maybe take some notes and not try everything at once, but maybe identify one or two things that you want to try in your teaching. And when you feel confident with those, come back and select another strategy or two. So no pictures of myself, my family, or my cats today, but we are going to jump right into this opening question, which is about your level of confidence regarding teaching for equity and inclusion on a scale of one to five. One being not at all confident. Five is super duper confident. I could lead this webinar, which is wonderful because I want to learn from you as well. Um, put a number in the chat box if you would, please. Okay, good. Three, four, five. Yay. Awesome. Three, five, four. Ooh, I see some super committed educators here. I really mean it when I say I want to learn from you because I, that's the beauty of the work that I get to do is to um, understand more about equity and inclusion by conversations with really smart people with like you. Threes, fours, and fives is what I'm seeing. Ooh, I saw, okay, good for the most part. Uh, thank you for engaging with me in this way. Wonderful, okay. I mean, again, even though um, I'm here as an invited speaker, I certainly am on my own equity journey. And I also know that I have still have a lot to learn. And I also want to be very transparent. That is a hallmark of my style. And, and you know, recognize that as a white woman, I have not lived the experiences of some of our students of color and other more marginalized identities. This is a passion of mine. I am committed to learning and doing my best. And then when I learn more, I do better. And that's the model that I would encourage us all to embrace is, um, I was just writing an email yesterday actually saying that committing to doing equity work is hard and there can be moments of discomfort where I have to learn that I said the wrong thing or did the wrong thing. But what really matters is how we respond to those inevitable learning moments, which can be a little bit uncomfortable. So. That's kind of my general um, understanding of where we are. And that email, just so that you know, by the way, uh, it was to a co-author. I am working on a, um, it's gonna be a free electronic book called The Norton Guide to Teaching, what is it, Equity-Minded Teaching. It will be made freely available by WW Norton. It's a publishing group who provides a lot of textbooks. And so I have the honor and the privilege of working with three other authors um, who I, again, I'm just learning so much from them. Um, so keep an eye out for that resource. There's a, I don't have it right at the tip of my fingers, but I could send a, a link that you could then sign up and get updates for when that's going to be available. It is a very practical oriented guide based in the research and it includes strategies for, again, no matter what modality that you'll be teaching should be out later this year. Okay, that was a tangent. But that was the email that I was sending yesterday is that equity work is hard work. And I personally have had some very uncomfortable moments. So um, 
I'm mm -hmm. just, we, we have to be committed to doing this. It takes some humility um, and willingness to learn. All of that was to say, those of you who do feel more confident, do feel free to, when the time comes, either unmute and talk, share some ideas, things that you've tried, things that you've learned. Or again, uh, we can also interact in the chat box during those intervals. Okay, so today we are here to talk about how we can be more inclusive in our classes. And the kind of the overarching goal is to help all of our students feel seen and heard and welcome in our classes and valued. And you know, this is the kind of thing that's easy to say, but I have had so many conversations with students where they literally say, I feel like a number. I don't, I have had students say, I feel like I don't exist. I don't matter to my instructors. And that's, I think that that's not any of our intention, but I think that this can happen in our classes where we are not connecting with students' basic humanity and where uh, at times our own implicit biases or unconscious biases may result in actions and communications that um, send signals to our students that they are not welcome in our classes, that they do not belong, that maybe college is not for them. And I think if you're here today, that is not our intention. So we want to learn about what we can do to uh, actively, proactively communicate that we see our students, we hear them, they're important to us, we value them, and every single learner in our class is welcome and we want to support their ability to be successful. So for me, thinking about teaching with equity and inclusion is about leveling the playing field. We know that every single learner in our classes comes to us with a unique history and lived experience. We know that our students are not brains on sticks, which is one of my favorite phrases. I may have already used it with you all. Um, it comes from Susan Rock, the author of a new book called Minding Bodies, which is about the physicality of how we learn. And she talks about how our students are not brains on sticks. They are whole people. They come to us with social history, with prior educational experiences. Many times our students come to us with some degree of fear or anxiety or mistrust based on a negative history in educational experiences. We know that there are opportunity gaps and resource gaps. And so the point is, is that our students are not coming to us all equally prepared for the rigor of our work. And that does not mean that we reduce the rigor. What this means is we want to provide supports so that students who are willing to do the work can be successful in our classes, recognizing that every single student is unique and comes to us with different levels of academic preparation. Uh, so to hear where we're going today is we're going to look a little bit at um, our theoretical foundations. As usual, we'll dive right into some principles and strategies and then have time at the end for your questions. And again, we'll pause partway through that uh, principle and strategy part. So guiding frameworks, and this may be a little bit of a review. I'm gonna go quickly through this. Um, where I'm basing uh, these recommendations on is first of all, universal design for learning. This is a framework that helps us to um, understand that every learner, every student, the way we learn, let me start that again. The way we learn is as unique as our fingerprints. Can you believe that? Every single person learns in a very unique way. No two people learn alike. And so creating a class experience like a one size fits all is not a way to achieve equity and inclusion. Uh, now, before you go, wait a minute, I can't have 30 different lessons because I have 30 people in my class. I'm not saying that. I am saying that universal design for learning helps us to provide options and support in the very design of the class. So before we even start teaching it, when we're planning the course, we create those options and those supports, understanding that everybody is unique. Our students today have varying uh, comp competing demands on their time. They might work, they might work more than one job. They might be raising a family. They might be helping to care for elders. They might be dealing with significant mental health issues. All of these things are what our students are coming to us, challenges uh, that could impede their progress. But UDL allows us to offer options. And here's an example. When we see a ramp that goes up next to a set of stairs in a building, we know that that ramp was put there for somebody using a wheelchair to make it easier for where they need to get to go. But we know that ramp also benefits a lot of other people as well. You know, a parent with a stroller or somebody with a suitcase on rolly wheels other people other than just that wheelchair user benefits from having that ramp. And so in our classes, if we have recorded videos, for example, those should be captioned 
because we know that students with a hearing impairment otherwise wouldn't be able to understand or see what was happening. But we also know that a lot of people who don't need the captions like to turn them on. It just helps them process that information in a different way. So that's what UDL is, is, is trying to provide supports and options right in the very design of the class. And um, we'll talk more about how we can do some of those things without getting too overwhelmed ourselves. We can't have all the options right away. We build in one option here, um, you know, one, uh, and we'll talk more about it, don't worry. <laughs> we add these things one at a time is where I was, where I was trying to go with that. We're also going to be working on culturally responsive teaching. And again, in all, all environments, whether online, in person, or some combination. This is Zaretta Hammond. I really appreciate her book, Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain, in which she talks a little bit about how that fear, that anxiety, and that mistrust that we were talking about actually shuts down learning. That's fairly well known, that uh, when we are feeling threatened or anxious, we cannot engage cognitively in the way that we can when we are relaxed and alert. And so um, she talks about how we can be culturally responsive in meaningful ways while still maintaining our rigorous standards. And it's more than, if you've been doing this work for any amount of time, you might have seen people saying, well, let's have a, a, you know, a cultural festival day in our class and we'll eat some different ethnic foods. And it, it's more than that, right? We need to go a little bit deeper. Those are some um, nice things to kind of offer our students, but there are other things that we can do that really looks at cultural dimensions. And in particular, Hammond bases her work on the cultural dimension of collectivistic culture or individualistic culture. Now, this is based on the work of uh, Hofstede. He's a Dutch sociologist who identified varying uh, cultural dimensions. And we're gonna focus on just this one. In the United States, for example, we pride ourselves on our rugged individualism. We are a highly individualistic society. It's um, the, the effort of the individual is most important. The success and happiness of the individual is most important. We don't want to accept help from anybody, but students in, not students, everybody <laughs> in other cultures, including um, certainly Latinx cultures, it's much more collectivistic. The well-being of the group is the most important thing. The harmony of, of the, uh, again, the, the group, the community. And we recognize that other people help us to be successful. It's not just our own efforts. And so Hammond invites us to think about, um, because especially in the States, uh, mainstream culture is very individualistic, but students might be growing up in homes that have cultural values that have shaped them toward a more collectivistic orientation. So one of the strategies that we'll talk about in this session uh, includes things like social interaction, social learning, collaborative work, those kinds of things to recognize that um, we can learn from and with other people as well as a, a cultural value that our students might be coming to us with. That's just, a, again, a quick overview, but we're going to jump right into principles and strategies because that's where the, you know, where the really practical stuff is. And what I've done today is I've organized a number of principles, kind of overarching principles, and then within each theme, we'll have a number of strategies that you can try that, that um, apply within those. So let's, um, let's jump right in. Let's start with an overarching principle of thinking just for a minute about equity and systemic inequities. Now, I um, talked a little bit about this just a few minutes ago, understanding that our students are coming to us having had access to varying kinds of resources and educational experiences. We know that some students are coming to us, uh, again, this could be first generation students, it could be students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, just not having been as prepared for college. And yet today's new majority students may be facing those barriers or have faced the, those barriers. It doesn't mean they're not capable of doing the work. I wholeheartedly believe that any student who is in our class is capable of learning and being successful when, this is a key point, when they are willing to do the work to do that. And it's our job, I would argue, to provide some of those uh, support structures that are gonna help them. But again, just recognizing that our students come to us uh, from those different backgrounds, you may have seen a graphic that looks like this. There's another very popular one with kids looking over a fence in a baseball field. And it helps us to recognize that equality is not the same as equity. 
we see here that if everybody gets the same size box, it doesn't solve the problem for every individual. And so equity is about giving individuals what they need, the resources that they need in order to be successful. Very common and helpful kind of depiction of the difference between equality and equity. However, a few months ago, I came across this blog and uh, I really liked this model a little bit better. The author was arguing that that, well, let me go back actually, that this um, image kind of implies a deficiency in the individual, right? <laughs> the, that we somehow hold the individual responsible for that deficiency. But here, this image helps us to see that everybody's starting from a different place and that we can recognize that and give that runner in the outside lane, quote unquote, a head start. So for, I like this depiction of equity helping us to remember that we're all coming from different starting places. Let's plan accordingly and recognize that. Now, that's a big topic, but we're going to move on. <laughs> it's just an invitation to kind of think about what are we even talking about here. In the very first talk that I uh, did here in January, actually, um, one of my main points is to design for inclusive social connections. So this may be familiar to you. And especially when we're teaching in online environments, it is so crucial that we should take the time to um, even class time, whether that's module ex exercises or whether that's something that you do live synchronous like this, we have to take the time to build relationships in online environments, especially. But I think that when we think about equity and inclusion, this kind of concept really broadens out. Um, we want, remember, to feel included is to feel welcome, is to feel like you belong here. And uh, the, the work of Emile Durkheim is a 19th century sociologist argued that, pers that people can't just decide they're included, <laughs> that the group has to extend that invitation of, of being included to the individual. So um, I see your comment, Lisa. I would love to engage with you further on that. Uh, um, yeah, do you want to pause? And let's go back to that if you want to. Uh, yeah, I could just say that because I ran track. <laughs> the reason why they stagnate people like that because the person on the outside has a little bit larger perimeter. So essentially you're creating a condition for equality. And um, so that's why I mentioned that because I sometimes think people get a little odd with this term equity because I've never heard people sufficiently explain it to me. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. I appreciate you unmuting and sharing that perspective that will give me, as I've already said multiple times, I always learn when I'm in these situations. So I will, I will think through whether that's um, an appropriate way to depict that. Thank you for sharing your experience. Appreciate that. Um, let's let's jump back into the social thing. And again, the reason that I kind of uh, dwell on this or emphasize this a lot is that I think in higher education we have not um, really mm -hmm. thought deeply hey, about the, the importance of social and emotional connections. In K twelve, we see that a lot. Social and emotional learning. In higher education, we tend to treat students as brains on sticks. So uh, I think it, we, in fact, I know there's abundant research to show that when people feel connected, when they feel included, uh, that predicts academic persistence, achievement, and better learning outcomes. And that's what we want. We talk about equity. Here's one way I like to think about it is that we want equitable learning outcomes, that we're not just doing some surface activities, but we're going deep into our teaching practices so that there are no so-called attainment gaps in grades or in graduation rates and such. Um, it's about helping every student be successful. Uh, that's one way that I think about it. So I do think it's important to proclaim and model inclusivity. And the reason I have proclaim and model is that, again, it's easy to say, uh, boy, I teach an inclusive class, but what are we doing that's actually signaling that to our students? And I, I think this has to kind of fall within your personal and professional comfort zone. Uh, I don't know if anybody happened to see this, but literally right as we were just getting started, I added my pronouns to my name here in Zoom. That's a way to signal to people that if they have, or that I'm interested in knowing what their pronouns are. And um, that's just a way to, to say that I recognize that this is an important element of people's identity. And so we can, you know, kind of invite people to share their pronouns just by sharing ours, if that makes sense. 
Um, I, again, a lot of institutions are having people, having faculty members create uh, DEI statements on their syllabus. And sometimes there's kind of some boilerplate language. I think that is important to explicitly tell students, hey, everybody is welcome here, regardless of race, ethnicity, uh, gender identities, um, you know, various uh, religious backgrounds, those kinds of things. We want to we want to state very explicitly that everybody is welcome in our class. And then we want to um, kind of analyze and do some self-reflection. I'll get more into this a little bit later. But maybe even one way of modeling inclusivity, for example, is to have a peer, a trusted colleague, come and observe your class. Because we know that implicit biases can result in behaviors that we don't even know that we're doing. There's abundant research to show that um, sometimes women are called on less in a class than men, or students of color are not given as difficult critical thinking questions. Um, so getting an objective observer to give you some feedback about things that you're doing that is not modeling inclusivity, that's another thing to consider as well. Uh, you won't be surprised to know that I think we should be foregrounding relationships and connections. Um, and one of the ways that we can do this is, again, first of all, for me, it's about a mindset, keeping this at top of mind that this actually is important and the research shows it promotes learning and academic achievement. But really important to get to know your students. Again, this is actually a way to begin to overcome implicit bias, where instead of looking at a person and making assumptions about that person's readiness for college or ability to do the work, that when we actually really get to know that individual or a little bit more about that individual, it helps us to be more supportive and overwrite those, um, those automatic sort of conclusions that may be happening without us even realizing it. A couple of ways to be proactive in the way that we get to know our students. You could consider a supportive survey where at the beginning of class you invite students to share a little bit of information about themselves. Maybe it's academic related things like major or you know progress toward degree or career goals. But I would also encourage you to think about sort of questions that affirm values and celebrate strengths. So questions like, um, what, uh, you know, what is one accomplishment that you're really, really proud of? Or uh, what would you say your strengths are? And the reason is, is again, there's research that shows that getting students to articulate what they're already good at is going to help them persevere when the going gets tough in our classes. Also, you can scan those surveys and talk to your class and say, you know, a number of you have done X, Y, and Z, or you are, you know, you showed that these were some of your strengths. And that's one way to help your students see that you see them is when you talk about the information that they have provided. Now, you could also on that survey, you could invite students to share things like um, challenges that they're facing this semester that may impede their progress. And I use the word invite very intentionally. You don't want to require students to share anything that they don't want to, but this has helped me become more empathetic in my own teaching. I often ask my students at the beginning of the semester, is there anything going on that you're a little bit concerned about? And one semester I had a student tell me that she was seven months pregnant. This was an eight-week online class, and she signed up for the class thinking that she would be um, ready and prepared um, but then just the prior week, her doctor had said he was concerned and she may need to go on bed rest. And now she was a little bit worried about whether she would be able to complete the class. Knowing that information in advance helped me to be more flexible with assignment deadlines and such. And so that's the kind of thing where I mean, where you could ask students, uh, what are your concerns? And it's optional, but then that can help you to maintain a flexible mindset if and when that student comes forward with a need. Um, so that's just one way. There's other ways to get to know your students, even things like um, certainly if you have office hours or student hours, as some people call them, um, you know, taking a, an effort to kind of chat a little bit with your students, small talk uh, before or after class, uh, small group meetings or discussion groups if you pop in, anything that you can do just to um, help you learn who the people are who are in your class that really helps uh, to create a more inclusive atmosphere. Another uh, activity that I think can be highly effective is to co-create community values with your students. Again, you could do this in lots of different ways. It could be an in-class discussion activity. It could be a breakout group activity. It could be a discussion forum, asynchronous. It could be a Padlet. I really like that tool. It's a little more visual way of collaborating either synchronously or asynchronously. 
It could be more of an individual assignment and then you collate everything. But what this is, is it's an activity that you do at the beginning of class where you solicit from your students what is important to us as a learning community? How do we want to treat people in this class? And you could maybe seed the activity with a couple of statements like, we don't marginalize anyone, or we respect evidence-based opinions, or we can communicate um, with collegial discourse. Uh, some of these things, you know, you might just want to put those in there and then ask the students what they would say is important. Then you can, again, as I mentioned earlier, sort of curate a, a final list, share that back with the students in whatever form. It could be a visual representation. And this can serve as a really useful tool if a hot moment comes up in class. If, um, if somebody posts something that's really, um, you know, very sensitive and not very nice in a discussion forum and other students have already seen it before you even know that it's there, you can use this and come back to it and say, remember, we agreed that, you know, this is not the way that we want to treat people in this community. Um, you can also circle back to this set of values periodically throughout the semester and just do an either like an informal check in with your students. How are we doing? Are we living up to our standards? Are we doing what we said was important to us? And that's just a nice way to um, hear from your students and, and invite their input and their voices while still setting some kind of norms um, as well. Another category of things that we are gonna do, and after this one, uh, we will pause for the questions and conversations. So uh, I have a handful of strategies within this category, and then just be getting your questions and comments ready as well. Um, designing for individual preferences and needs. This is where I was going with the universal design for learning uh, framework. Again, we know that some students are coming to us with uh, physical disabilities, with learning disabilities, with um, to, you know a lot on their plate, family obligations. We know that for some students, they um, they have to make a choice between buying textbooks or you know going to the grocery store. We know that students have all these different kinds of life circumstances, needs, and preferences about how they learn, and they have different strengths too. We can think about the cultural wealth that students are bringing to us um, and the experience that they've had that can, that can contribute to a enhanced learning experience. So when we think about designing for individual learning and needs, uh, sorry, preferences and needs, it's about offering those options and not doing it all at once, as I mentioned. It might be, uh, for example, when I first started doing this a number of years ago, I allowed my students to choose whether to type a discussion post or video record it. We know that students from oral cultures may be able to better express themselves in uh, verbal words, but we also know that for some students, the prospect of having to record a video is terrifying. They prefer maybe English is not their first language or, you know, in, in your case, maybe Spanish is not. Um, and so inviting students to have the option to demonstrate their thinking and their learning in the way that um, works best for them and their strengths that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. You can make one little change here and there and keep iterating and um, over time create a, a, that more inclusive and equitable class. So one of the ways to do this is as exactly as I was just talking about offering both choice and variety. Um, for example, I, the example that I just shared about the discussion post, uh, a common example would be you can either write a 10 page research paper or record a 15 minute video presentation, um, offering ways for students to develop and demonstrate their learning. That's what I'm talking about here. Uh, if you uh, can remember from way back in your old English class in uh, high school, it may be the case that your teacher would have given you an essay test and you had three different questions to choose from. You could choose the one that you felt most confident about. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about here. So if students, um, do they have an option of watching a video lecture or reading the text? If you have a video lecture, and I would argue that these should be short little mini lectures, can you provide a PDF um, of a transcript or even a PDF of the main bullet points? so that students who want to could print that and take notes or read the text and highlight and annotate uh, these kinds of things. So again, it's not that you have to have multiple options and flavors of every single thing in your class that would be very overwhelming and soul crushing for you as the instructor, but little by little, 
where can you offer um, students the opportunity to exercise agency in how they're going to engage with class activities and materials and how they're going to show what they have learned. Now on that last point, we can think about equity, including more and various assessments for our students. Historically, I, I don't think a lot of people still teach this way, but traditionally in the college setting, it was the case, and you probably had classes like this, where you would go to class and it was just a lecture, a large lecture. You weren't necessarily held accountable for reading the textbook, so you may or may not have read the textbook. And then there was only two exams in the entire class, a midterm and a final. And that's what your whole grade depended on, was the midterm and the final. Well, that doesn't really recognize that students are coming to us with different strengths and levels of preparation, because if you bomb that midterm, um, it's essentially game over. And that's going to um, teach students that they were right, that they don't really belong in college, and that's going to confirm for them that they are not cut out for college and many times lead them to stop out. And that's not the outcome that we're looking for. So a simple change, if you do teach a class with a few high stakes exams, a simple change would be to offer more tests, just as rigorous, they can be just as demanding, but because there are more of them, if a student um, doesn't do well on that first one, there is more opportunity to recover in terms of their grade. And this is really notorious. Our students come to us, especially if they're, um, you know, I mean, fresh out of high school, but even returning students. In high school, it may have been the, fa the fact that they could show up for class, take a test, didn't really need to study for it, and did fine. But that is not necessarily the case in college. So oftentimes our students approach that first exam with false confidence. I'm sure you've seen this in your own teaching. They think they know the material. They end up with a D. Here again, that can reinforce their sense that they don't belong in college. That can lead to stopping out. So when we have um, early tests, for example, I was working with a biology teacher. Her class used to have the reputation of being a weed out class. We did a really major uh, redesign and she used to have three exams. Instead, she ended up with eight unit tests. Like I said, just as rigorous, but there's more opportunities for students to determine if they are on track and if, they, if their confidence is well-founded. And then again, if one of those tests doesn't go very well, they still have other opportunities to make those things up. I'm also, I really believe that we should try to offer variety in how we're assessing student learning. We know that test anxiety is a thing and it definitely hinders learning and shuts down performance. And so if the only thing that we have in our class are tests or quizzes or exams, we're not serving the differing needs of the students who are in front of us. Where can we offer variety in how we're assessing students? I have learned that discussion forum posts are a great way to check student understanding. Certainly, um, again, you could have weekly quizzes that are much lower stakes. You could have uh, written assignments, and I have some ideas on creative grading strategies to reduce your grading burden. Um, just what are, you know, is there a group project? Is there a creative project that students could do to demonstrate their learning? Or can you offer them all of the different options? I was talking with this really an energetic um, engineering professor last year, and he was telling me that his students work in teams, and then he tells them on a project, and he tells them that they can choose however they want to show their learning, what was the outcome of the project. And what he was sharing me, with me was really fascinating, students um, creating a mobile app, for example, or an infograph, or a graphic novel, or a website, like all kinds of really great things that students were creating to show. and he assessed them all and you know these were all valid ways so whether that i mean to me honestly that sounds a little overwhelming i'm not sure that i would do that but um, look for ways in your class and within your teaching style that and your philosophy that might allow students to have more options about how they can show their learning and give them more opportunities so that if one doesn't go quite so well they still have other opportunities to pull up their grade Another way to be really equitable in our teaching is to show our students that we are reducing the um, opportunity for biased grading. So to do this, we can be super clear in what we are asking students to do, and we want to show them that we are being very objective in the way that we are assessing their work. A few ways that we can uh, 
be deliberately clear and objective. I'm gonna, you know, I noticed this has the next Q&A there. I actually slid in one more slide. So after this slide, I have one more strategy and then we'll stop for Q&A. Uh, thinking about teaching with clarity and objectivity, things like using a rubric so students know right up front exactly how you're going to assess them. If rubrics aren't your style, checklists can also be very clear in terms of helping students make sure that they have all the required elements providing examples of previous student work. Sometimes faculty ask me, I don't wanna provide a an example that's gonna shut down originality and, and students are just gonna do what that student did. Well, that's a fair question um, or a fair concern. Maybe providing a little piece, like here's an introductory paragraph um, that you can uh, learn from. Another great way to provide examples is provide an A example and a C example and a rubric and then get students to analyze. This could be in groups, it could be individually, have them analyze what the C student could have done better to um, make, you know, to earn the A. These are just ways of helping students to really know what you're asking them to do and recognize that you're going to be objective. I'm also a huge fan of the TILT framework. Um, make a note of this, go back to it later. TiltHigherEd.com, there is robust research on this approach. And what it shows is that um, this framework, and I'll explain it here in a minute, uh, benefits all students and disproportionately benefits students of color. And so um, TILT stands for transparency in learning and teaching. And there are essentially three elements to this framework. For any instructions that you give to your student, any paper, any project, even a discussion form, give them three discrete parts. Number one, here's what I want you to do. Number two, here's why. I want you to do it. Here's how it's going to help your learning. And number three, here's how. Here's how to do it. Again, robust research um, with lots of disciplinary examples and case studies at that website. Uh, the work of Dr. Marianne Winkleness, um, just helping students see exactly what you're, they're supposed to do and how and why. When we know the purpose of a task that we've been asked to do, um, that really can motivate us. And just think about your own experience if you're asked to do some mundane task for a committee and it doesn't seem very purposeful to you, it's hard to stay motivated and engaged. So a very simple equity focused strategy is to help your students understand why they're doing what they're doing. Um, and that is going to uh, increase engagement and motivation. And this last one, and then we're gonna pause for your questions and comments is to maybe think differently about grading schemes. And, I believe that many of us who are teaching today just have not been invited to think about these things. We do things, um, syllabus policies, grading schemes, maybe the way that they were given to us or the way that worked for us when we were students, but equity-minded experts these days are encouraging us to think differently about grading. There's a great book, it's called Grading for Equity by Joe Feldman. Um, really worth in uh, looking at that if you want to dive deeper into this. But here's a few ways that, that you could reconsider your current grading practices in order to grade for equity. Remember, as we were talking about um, if a student bombs one exam, how are they going to make it up? Well, one equity minded grading strategy is to have a policy that students can drop their lowest exam score. And students tell us that when that policy is in place, it just reduces their anxiety overall. Remember, anxiety impedes learning and performance. When they are not quite so worried, like if one test doesn't go very well, they know they can drop it, that's going to foster um, better test outcomes. Uh, another thing, and I, I love this idea, it's to stagger your grading weight. So exams, <laughs> excuse me, let's say an exam at the beginning of the semester is worth fewer points than the exam at the end of the semester, and it kind of increases over time. At the beginning of a semester, a student is just trying to get to know you and your material and your, you know, how do you put tests together? And, you know, it, um, we want to give them an opportunity to learn those kinds of things and to get more confident with our material. So thinking about grading such that activities, assignments, uh, papers, projects at the end, exams are worth more than the ones in the beginning, that could be an easy fix that um, we could try. One other idea for grading for equity here is to allow redos, retakes, test corrections, anything like that um, where students can rework any missed questions on a test. And you can add a metacognitive element to this as well 
ask them to write a sentence or two about where they went wrong when they, you know, how they, how they got that question wrong. What this does is you can offer them the opportunity to earn back partial credit, just as an example, or you can have them take an auto graded uh, test or quiz and make it multiple attempts, keep taking it as often as you want to until you get the score you want. What these kinds of approaches do is to foster a growth mindset and to teach students that failure is essentially inevitable. What, matter, uh, what matters is um, how we recover from that, how we learn from that, how we approach the next exam differently so that we're more prepared. So I'm gonna stop. I do see a question that has already come in and that's good because it's time for questions. Uh, so um, I'm going to pull down the slides, as you may or may not know, or may have heard me say before, the slides are a barrier. And we know that staring at slides for a whole hour adds to the physical strain that we feel in our eyes. So I would encourage you, if you are teaching in this kind of an environment, to look for times that you can pull down slides. And now I'm going to read this very good question here. I'd only glimpsed it, so let's look at it. How is dropping a test score equity and not equality? I don't want to get hung up on terms but I wanted to be sure I understand what you mean by equity and grading. It's a great question. Uh, Teresa, I will invite you if you want to unmute and elaborate. And if you don't want to, I will address the question as it is written. Okay, I'll go ahead. And these are good questions. And um, I'm gonna remind us <laughs> that at the beginning, I said, I'm still learning too, but here's the way I think about um, allowing students to do the work. And something else I said is students who are willing to do the work. Um, thank you, Teresa. Thanks for that quick explanation there. No pressure for anybody ever to unmute if, if they're not comfortable doing that uh, for lots of good reasons. So um, now I forgot what I was gonna say, which was, um, well, I'll start again. When we think about equality, my understanding is that it's like everybody gets the same. And, you know, you might see this. Um, I'm thinking of a K-12 example. My daughters are all in middle school and high school, and every student got an iPad. Maybe you have seen this in your um, context. Everybody gets the exact same thing. But that does not necessarily advance equity. I live in rural Arizona. Where I live, there are many families who live on the Navajo and Hopi reservations where there is not good internet. And so giving every student um, an iPad doesn't necessarily advance equity because for some students, that's basically a paperweight. It, it doesn't do anything if you don't have an internet connection. And so thinking about, um, let me read, let me just review the um, question here, dropping a test score equity and not equality. Again, my best understanding comes from hearing from a student talking about how it just reduces her anxiety overall. So um, some students don't have test anxiety. They enjoy the experience. They perform well. They're confident. Those students are going to do fine on all the tests if they know the material. Some students have crippling test anxiety. I will also share one of my daughters is actually at school today taking the pre-ACT she did not want to do it. She was experiencing extreme anxiety before going to school today, and she's in the middle of doing that right now, and I hope she's doing okay because she herself has experienced panic attacks in test settings because of that kind of crippling anxiety. So I'm a little sensitive. Now, exactly how that parses out as equity versus equality, I, I just feel like um, it's about recognizing that individuality and the variability of our students. Um, I think it's a good question, though, Teresa. <laughs> I think you you kind of stumped me a little bit on this. Does anybody else want to jump in with their thoughts on this question? I also see Terrence's comment about um, give students more opportunities to for to learn how to complete the task and then multiple attempts. I think multiple attempts. Yeah. Um, helps. Um, Miss Darby, hi, this is Michelle yes. again. Um, good to see you again. Uh, I have my camera off, sorry, I'm no today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I was just going to put something in the chat, but I'll speak up on, I do offer the best three out of four and it's a rather large class. And I find that, yes, that definitely takes the anxiety down. And it also makes that fourth test, which is during final exams an optional final, um, which I find also lights a fire under my students to do study hard and do really well for tests one through three, right? So if you know you have a finance class, accounting, other difficult classes, you're going to want to kind of be shored up for this one. And it cannot hurt your grade to take the optional final either in my class, mm -hmm. which is really a good tool for them too, because then um, if they want to take it and try to raise their grade, they can, but we just take the best three out of four. Um, I actually adopted this from uh, my predecessor, and I thought it was a little crazy at first to offer, you know, it was actually five to begin with, and I thought that was a bit much, <laughs> so I went to drop it down to four, but just having that extra test option, and I just do agree from a personal standpoint, being a student, um, early college years, that test anxiety is real and you do try to find coping mechanisms as you as you mature. But still, if you have that in you, that allows also with that testing and then uh, just to bring the level of anxiety down. And then the other thing is when you have an online class and I've of course taught my fair share of online now with COVID, um, you know, it's also another additional stress to take it on uh, different, you know, I forget what the name of ours is, but the online tools to keep cheating mm -hmm. from happening mm -hmm. uh, and then technology not working, that offers anxiety too. So I do feel like that multiple test system is more inclusive and it allows for those students who do struggle uh, with other testing issues. So I just wanted to add, it's been very successful in my class for the past three years. Wonderful. Thank you so much for unmuting, Michelle. And um, yeah, I, again, I know that you all are doing things. Um, so I love to facilitate these connections and contributions from all of you, I, I certainly agree. Something like test anxiety shuts down a student from demonstrating what they know about the, the material. We're testing, we're assessing how well they could take tests is another way to think about it. And so when I had that slide that says grading for equity, it is about, again, as I said, kind of thinking differently about grading. There's a movement called ungrading. I'm not quite there yet, but I am a big fan of alternative grading or um, that more equity focused grading because it is a site of inequity. Students' grades follow them. They um, influence and shape academic and career opportunities. And uh, so that's why for me, it's a really important element to consider. Um, a few more comments um, about equity being, uh, recognizing that students have um, they're not all in the same situation. They're not all on the same page. They're coming to us from different starting points. We have a comment from Michael about um, being frustrated by students who refuse to follow a template. Um, when you give it to them, I hear you. And let me let me just validate what you're saying there. Uh, we I would encourage us to provide those supports, those templates and those guides. And yes, it is frustrating when they don't take advantage of the guidance that we're providing to them. I do think we need to remind ourselves that we can't make our students learn. We can't make them all be successful and that inevitably there will be some students who won't um, take advantage of the supports that we're offering to them. However, and, and again, trying to set aside our um, frustration with that and, and remain focused on providing those supports, guides and templates so that students who choose to take advantage of them have that um, opportunity again to show what they're learning, not necessarily show that they know how to format a thing um, as an example. And then I see um, the comment from Teresa about disability services. Um, yes, def exactly, that working with disability services for students who have um, test taking anxiety, that kind of thing is a really wonderful and important thing to do. Some experts now are saying that some students don't want to out themselves. Does that make sense that they don't want to reveal some of these challenges that they're dealing with? And so maybe thinking, as I said, with UDL, this is where this comes from, is that the supports are built into the design of the class so that students don't have to reveal things they're not comfortable revealing. Uh, that's just another way to kind of think about it as well. And uh, dropping a homework or quiz grade, if you offer a number of assessments, the dropped assessment can account for a bad day. We all have bad days. I feel like I'm tripping over my tongue a lot here today. I don't know what's going on, but recognizing that um, this happens, you know, there are some days that we aren't able to demonstrate our learning quite as effectively. And then I do see a comment that recently there was a book club on ungrading. It's actually sitting on my shelf and I haven't read it yet. Maybe if I did read it, I would be, uh, <laughs> I, I definitely think there's some potential there. I just don't, I'm not an expert on that. 
Okay, wonderful. Thank you all so much. Let's come back into, um, I think I have two more categories to discuss and I don't wanna run out of time for those. There's a really good questions and comments. So thank you um, for your contributions there. We're gonna think a little bit about cultural inclusion. Now I am fascinated and have worked to develop my own intercultural competence. I believe that um, this is an area that could really serve us well as educators. And I am also on my intercultural competence journey. So again, I, I'm still learning, but let me share with you a few things that I have uh, learned through my research and experience. And I think one of the first things that we have to do is to, um, to ask ourselves this question, can our students see themselves in our classes? Do any of the images of people in our slides or in our textbooks or in our online classes do they have people that look like our students? And again, I wanna be very careful and very clear to say, we have to avoid tokenism. We can't just you know, include a picture of a person of a different skin color or an underrepresented race in STEM, for example, and think that we've done the job. However, it's also important for our students to be able to see people who look like them in our field, in our discipline. And for example, this is why I have a picture of Zaretta Hammond on my slide. It is not a token effort to have a black woman on my slide presentation. It is that this is the work of somebody who I really re respect and I am deliberately making a choice to show that she is a woman of color and that I'm elevating her voice and her contribution as an ally. So um, thinking about, do you, like I said, do your students see any anybody who looks like them? There was a really great experiment a few years back where um, what happened, it was a, I think it was a computer science online class. The researchers created two versions of the class. In one, there were images of office-like settings with computers and desks and like office furniture, that kind of thing. And in the other, the experimental group, they had images of people, including women, including historically minoritized people in that class and the students in that class with people who looked like them, uh, they saw increased completion rates among women and students of color. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about is we can be deliberate to include images or cultural references or narratives of um, you know, people who are like them in our classes and to be deliberate in the way that we do that. Now, as I already kind of tipped my hand, um, you know that I'm a big fan of social learning interactions. And here I'm thinking less about just relationship building and more about opportunities to work with each other and learn from each other. Whether it's a really well-crafted discussion forum, whether it's that Padlet that I talked about earlier, whether it's a group project that you have carefully and intentionally designed, whether it's informal group activities. I'm a big fan of something that's being called study buddies. And in my interpretation, I'm sure there's lots of different ways to do this, but I like the idea of putting students in groups of two or three, asking them to exchange phone numbers and then text each other if you are stuck on something or if you wanna to get together outside of class to, to review before a quiz or like essentially um, facilitating those kinds of social interactions where students can learn from and with each other uh, is where I'm kind of thinking about here. We also know that everybody learns well from stories and games and particularly in some cultures, these are highly important where the way that we learn, the way that we know what we know is, is significantly shaped by stories. Um, you know, think about fables as an example. These are things that teach us lessons. Learning games are really, really important. Again, for everybody and in some cultures in particular games show, you know, play a significant role so um, thank you, Michelle, good to see you. So thinking about stories and games in our teaching may seem foreign to you in higher education, but it's so powerful. We all tune in more effectively with stories. That's why I choose to share stories from my own personal life, including the fact that my daughter is, my poor daughter is struggling with her PACT right now. Um, that helps to engage people and engagement comes before learning as Terry Doyle has said. So stories can be personal experience. Students want to learn from your own professional experience. Um, I'm thinking about a nursing instructor who talks to students about what actually happens at the hospital bed when, you know, when a crisis develops. Students are gonna be so motivated um, with your personal experience. 
um, stories of role models, um, you know, leaders in their field, again, especially when you are intentional to include diverse role models and leaders, um, and then learning games. Some of you, or let me add one more thing, things like case studies or scenarios, another great way to incorporate stories and increase attention, motivation, and engagement. Games, some of you may already use Kahoot. If you haven't discovered it, it is so fun. It's just a quiz game. Some of you may use things like Jeopardy games or other trivia, you know, review games. They really do work. We like games and they help us re uh, structure retrieval practice, which deepens and um, embeds learning so that it is there, it sticks, the, so that the learning sticks and we have it available to us. So stories and games, and then one more uh, recommendation in this category, and then I have one final category, is to highlight the relevance and usefulness. We know there's, again, there's research to show that when students understand how what they're doing in this class relates to them, they will be more engaged in that work. And this can be in a variety of ways. Does it relate to their everyday lived experience? Does it relate to their academic or career goals? Um, does it relate to them in terms of they see people who look like them, right? So um, highlighting that kind of relevance, there's a great activity called Build Connections, where you ask students in one column to identify a hobby, basically, and then in this column, write about or figure out how what they're learning in this class will make them better at their hobby. Um, coming out of the Motivate Lab at the University of Virginia, build connections. It's just about helping students connect what they're learning to their own personal interests. And, and again, we know that fostering interest is going to elevate learning. Uh, we can also ask students to identify for themselves, how is what you're learning gonna be useful? There's to you personally in your, in your career, Again, research shows that asking students to write a paragraph about that will actually help them to voluntarily put down the video games, social media, and other distractions and do the really mundane, tedious homework set that they know they need to do because it's going to help them get that job in that aeronautical engineering company someday. So um, messaging to students how what they're learning is relevant, thinking about examples, stories, activities that highlight the, you know, that are relatable, basically, and then getting students to articulate for themselves how what they're learning is relevant and useful. These are all very powerful equity-minded strategies. Okay, um, yeah, let's move to my last category, <laughs> and then we should have a few minutes. At the end, I, I got a little distracted. I see that there were some other great comments. I'm not going to dwell on those right now, but again, uh, share your ideas there as you would like to. This uh, final category, I think, is so important. Again, it's really going to foster um, better learning outcomes for any student who comes to college thinking that they're not sure they have what it takes, thinking that they um, aren't comfortable in the environment because they're the first person in their family to go to college, um, thinking that, and uh, I love the work of Sandra McGuire. I don't have her, I didn't include a slide of her today, but um, she's doing really great work. Her book is called Teach Students How to Learn. She argues that students are really good scientists because in high school, as I mentioned earlier, they can just show up and take the test and do fine. So that's what they're going to do in college because they have a lot of evidence that tells them that that works. Um, so we need to structure the learning activities for our students um, that we know would help them be successful, but we also know well, chances are fair they don't know that they should do that or um, that they're not going to be disciplined enough <laughs> to do those things. So that's what high structure is about. And this is where I was going earlier when I said to structure things that students who choose to do the work, it is not spoon feeding, it is not hand holding, it is not lowering our standards or reducing rigor. It is upholding our standards. That is equity minded teaching. We don't do our students any uh, favors if we lower our standards and send them on to the next class or the job market underprepared. We uphold our standards and we provide the high structure so that students who are willing to put the time in, exert the effort and do the work can attain those standards. That was my sales pitch. Here's some ideas on how to do it. Um, as I mentioned, purposeful activities and tasks. Again, students think that reading their textbook and rereading and reading their notes and highlighting their notes and rereading, they think that that is effective study methods. We know that it is not. It creates something called fluency in the short term that works on the exam the next day. They're gonna have that information there. Two months from now on the final exam, they won't. That learning did not stick. 
So we know that there are things that can help students get um, that learning embedded in their memory. And we also know that students are very busy people and may not have the time or the discipline to voluntarily do those activities and tasks. I'm talking about things like a reading quiz. We know that we could tell students and we should tell students, quiz yourself after you finish each section of a chapter. But how many students are actually gonna quiz themselves? Create a quiz for them. Uh, discussion forums can foster really productive exploration and interaction and practice with new concepts and ideas. Like let's just imagine that students leave your class and as they're walking across campus, they're talking about what they did in class that day. Well, how likely is that? Create the activity for them where they're really going to, we're going to do that. I have a biology friend who has a concept map in her class. She provides a partial concept map that students complete while doing the chapter and working through the unit. And then at the end, she provides them the completed concept map so she knows they have accurate information to study with. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. By the way, that this is the same instructor, by the way, I mentioned whose class used to be a weed out class. At the beginning um, of her redesign where she added these kinds of homework assignments and such, um, students complained about the busy work in their class because they're doing, you know, their roommate or their friend, they didn't have all that stuff to do in the same, in their section. By the end of the semester, her students were thanking her for structuring all of those activities, what they used to call busy work because their friend and their roommate, they were failing their biology class. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about is to assign um, activities that you know is gonna help them learn materials, stagger the deadlines to how to help them pace themselves and um, get them to engage in productive learning behaviors. We also know that one of the ways we can provide structure is to help students see where they are and where they're going. This is really important in asynchronous online classes where um, just giving some, some systems, not very many of them, but some of the publisher systems have like progress bar as an example. If you don't have, that's very effective is what I'm trying to say. If you don't have that available to you, you could um, signal it to your students in your asynchronous online modules just through your own wording, or maybe there's an icon or something that you can use to help students know where they are and where they're going. This is why, although I admit um, it didn't exactly align, this is why on one of my slides, I had a little next Q&A piece because that's a signpost. And then I snuck in one more slide after that and neglected to change my text. But it's a signpost to you. This is why I have the agenda slide at the beginning showing you what we're going to be doing with our time. Anything like this will help your students stay focused and help them understand what to expect. Um, really important. I, I have a friend in marketing who has like a pie chart at the beginning of her in-person class and the pie chart just shows at a glance, we're going to spend about 35% of class time today in group activity and about 45% in lecture and I don't know what the other percentage is because I didn't think through this example, but uh, <laughs> just a quick little at a glance, here's what we're doing in class today. That's the kind of thing that really can help students, um, that kind of structure that can help them stay focused. Now, these next couple of topics are from Sandra McGuire's book, Teach Students How to Learn, based on the idea that they think that reading and rereading is going to be helpful. Uh, give them some coaching on productive learning behaviors. Remember a few minutes ago, I said, tell your students to quiz themselves after they finish a reading. Um, there's all kinds of reading strategies that students don't know about. So think about whether you could include those strategies and that kind of coaching in your own teaching. I was observing a statistics instructor this past fall. It was her first semester teaching statistics. And I saw her do something on the very first day of class that is exactly what I'm talking about. She said to her students, look, this is hard. I know introductory statistics can be really daunting and it is hard, but work through the reading before class. Even if it takes you a long time, try to read the whole chapter, then come to class. We're going to work with the concepts. And then after class, go back to the chapter and, and brush up on anything or review or make sure that you're confident. And that's the kind of coaching that I'm talking about in terms of how to study. Uh, lots more very practical recommendations in McGuire's book that I can highly recommend. And one of those um, categories of recommendations is to actually assign metacognition. Now we touched on this earlier when I said, if you offer test corrections, also ask students to identify where they went um, awry. You know, what did they, what was the misstep that caused them to get the wrong answer? Getting students to articulate for themselves and think about their thinking, that's what metacognition is, thinking about our thinking and our process when it comes to studying and um, performing in academic environments. 
that's a really great thing to do. And again, I would say, let's coach our students to do that. Let's message that, but also maybe assign it where, for example, there's um, something called an exam wrapper. If you haven't heard of this before, I do have a sense that I'm talking to a lot of folks here with good experience, but the exam wrapper um, asks students, how did you prepare for this exam? Uh, maybe what grade do you think you're gonna get? And then there's a follow-up piece after students get their um, exam scores. Okay, how did that go? Was that what you were expecting? What are you gonna do differently? What study methods are you going to do differently? So you can actually embed those questions right into the exam, or you can make it um, a written reflection that students are required to do before you enter their grade into the grade center. Lots of ways to hold students accountable for engaging in that metacognition. And last but not least, this is my last suggestion for today. We need to be thinking about our thinking as well. We, uh, in order to advance equitable outcomes in our classes, we need to engage in self-examination in uh, reflection, in scholarly teaching, which is a term that indicates that we're thinking about what we're teaching and how we're teaching it and where we can make improvements. Um, engaging in that kind of self-analysis uh, really is important. What do you think about the people who are in front of you? Um, how, where are some areas that you could um, advance equity in your grading schemes or in the options that you make available for students with various disabilities or pressures in their lives? So thinking about our own approaches, equally important. I'm gonna finish with my uh, signature question um, now, and we had some good numbers ahead or you know, earlier, so hopefully maybe they're even stronger. You could put a five plus, or you could put a six or a 10. Now, what would you say? Um, how confident do you feel? Have you gained new ideas? Feel free to put a number in the chat box and we're gonna move into a little bit more time to learn from each other. Four, good. Yay, five plus, yay. Good, awesome. Some fours and fives and four pluses and five pluses. I love it. Thank you so much. Uh, we have, you know, a few minutes left here. If somebody would like to unmute with a question or a strategy to share, I think I saw one from Veronica. Um, yeah, about cultural concepts and counseling. Um, wow. If you want to unmute and tell us more about that, feel free or other. I don't see any threes or twos now. Now I only see fours and fives, yay. Yes, that was a, a very effective assignment. I Please. provided a, a list of movies, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the most popular one was uh, Gran Torino, uh, but A League of Their Own. These were older movies and also some newer movies. And um, it was very, very effective because it did several things. It helped the creativity. Some had never created a PowerPoint before. Uh, some people who were very expert and skilled in PowerPoint uh, showed their, their, their level and helped others to improve their skill level. Yeah. But the learning was, was just uh, dynamic, incredible, and very deep and fun. Wonderful. Yeah, and fun is a key element. People like to watch movies. Yeah. Thank they you. These movies from a different perspective. Awesome. Great example. Other examples or questions or thoughts? Or put something in the chat box. Somebody in one of these webinars recently, you know, this is pretty much what I do as my full-time job now. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that, but that's true. I do teach on the side. Somebody in one of these crickets moments said, you know what, our brains are just too full. We... <laughs> so I don't know if that's happening here, <laughs> if not, um, but. Well, I think there was a fair amount of movement from four to five, it looks like to me. So yes, a lot, a lot of processing maybe going on. I think so too. Let me add one little piece. You talked about exam wrappers, but any assignment can be wrapped. So you can wrap a paper, a group project, you know, the, the kinds of issues that arise will be a little different. I love that. Thank you, Susan. It's definitely true. Another word is called cognitive wrappers. Jose mm -hmm. Bowen uses that term, cognitive wrappers. So it, it is assigning something that gets students to think about their process, what they've learned from the process. Reflection is really, really key to um, fostering that enduring learning. In fact, I was 
um, observing an online graduate level class recently, and every paper assignment has a reflection that's due at the end um, with questions like, what did you learn from this process? What was the most challenging? What was the most surprising? So yeah, love that. Thanks for reminding us of that, Susan. And I guess one last thing that I would add on there is, for me, a lot of this work is just things that we may not have thought about doing before in our teaching. We know that faculty are underprepared to teach. There's not a whole lot of training that we receive in our graduate programs. And we know that a very common way to teach is to rely on what we experienced as students. And so if our classes didn't have cognitive wrappers, it just may not occur to us to do that. But um, that's that's kind of where we're going here is to think about how to use class time differently. Maybe we coach or have activities or assignments that are are not specifically about the um, assignment. You know, the con. Sorry, I meant the content. Um, just building in some of those other things. So I do see a comment that came in from Martha, and regrettably, I don't know what it says. And there you are, Evelyn. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, as agreed is helping me to see that Martha was saying collaborative and team learning also helps students learn from one another. Exactly. Yes. So important. Learning is very social and um, helping students learn from each other through those collaborations, through those purposeful team and group activities. Really, really important. It can also celebrate. Remember uh, earlier I said we can think about the cultural wealth that our students are bringing in the, the uh, lived experiences and the strengths that they offer um, when we intentionally design those collaborative and team and group learning activities that helps others to see the strengths that um, their classmates bring to the equation. Mm -hmm. Well, now my brain is getting full. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, and we'll just take this time to thank you for being with us today. And it was a a wonderful presentation uh, again. And we do have an, a, a third presentation, which the title is TBD because we haven't decided on which presentation it's going to be yet, but we'll do that shortly and have all that information sent out to you. Um, but, but thank you so much, Flower. Always a wonderful um, um, session full of things to think about and ideas yeah. and strategies and everything. So, and, let, and again, uh, small things, right? Just small yes. little tweaks that we can make. So, and um, thank you everyone for attending and yes. taking time out of your day. Susan, do you wanna?